I was born and raised in New York City, and I am a city girl to my core. The first time my parents took me outside of New York City to visit my uncle in New Jersey, I was standing on the front step of his lovely suburban home when a fast-moving shadow caused my three-year-old heart to damn near beat out my chest, and I shouted, "That's the biggest rat I've ever seen!" My uncle calmly responded, "Sweetie, that's a cat." To which I shot back, "Oh yeah? Well, what's it doing outside then?" My parents realized there are some things you just couldn't learn in New York City. So every summer we migrated out to Montauk, Long Island, the easternmost point of New York State. My father only got two weeks off from work a year, so whenever August rolled around, we packed everything we could into the company van and followed that yellow-spotted line of highway out until we couldn't go any farther. This is where I learned to swim, where I heard the word "shit" for the first time from a bunch of surfers. Down by the beach, how to ride a bike on rainy afternoons, swerving around puddles, how to drive a car in the hardware store parking lot, how to kiss a boy with sand between my toes. Time goes to Montauk to take a break. It loosens its belt, takes a seat on the front porch next to my father and his Weber grill. It putters around the kitchen while my mother is kneading the dough of her homemade sourdough bread and chuckles when it catches her speaking out loud to herself, telling nobody in particular that we should roast peaches tonight. I bet oatmeal would be delicious tomorrow morning if we roasted some peaches tonight. Time stalls in Montauk. I am seven years old. My little brother is three. He splashes in the baby pool while I brave the full-length Olympic-sized one by myself, chubby in my one piece. My thighs brush against each other as I tread water in the shallow end. I look up to see an older girl, perfect in her bikini, tall and tan, and probably on her way to meet her handsome prince charming boyfriend. She glows as she glides past me, tosses her hair like she has all the answers, and I wonder if I'll ever be a woman like that. That summer, I learn how to wish on stars. I am 12 years old. My little brother is eight. He can surf better than I can, and I hate it. I wait until he and all the other surfers are done for the day before paddling my fat sponge of a board out past the breakers. There is nobody left in the water. Makes the ocean glow golden. I tuck my legs up. That summer, I learn how to be alone. I am 16. My brother is 12 and at the beach. I am reading magazines on the couch when my mother appears in the living room holding her laptop, the only computer we have in the house. My brother has downloaded his first porn video, and she is trying to figure out what should be done about it. That night at dinner, there is no mention of it at the dining room table. But later, when I go to check my email, I discover she has made a new folder on the desktop, labeled it "PK's porn," and left it there for him to find. That summer, I learned how to love my parents. There are some things you cannot learn in New York City. There are some places where fish nets do not mean stockings, where the learning happens in between moments, like after a wave passes and you break the surface, gasping for air. I am 24. The landmarks are the same. Same stretch of beach, same hardware store parking lot. Some of the names have changed. The pool hasn't. I make my way to the shallow end and wade in slow. In Montauk, I can take my time. I look up to see a little girl, chubby in her one piece, clutching the wall and watching me enter the water. Her eyes as big as summer tomatoes and just as red from all the chlorine rubbing. I almost speak to her. But before I can, there is a splash behind me. A woman, well into her fifties, chubby in her one piece, has cannonballed into the deep end. She comes up coughing, flailing, water in her nose. She comes up laughing. The little girl giggles, and me, well, I am laughing too. Thank you. Thanks. I attended one school, an international school in New York City, from kindergarten through twelfth grade. I spent years of my life in this place, and while I was there, I was surrounded by students from 
South Africa, Norway, Pakistan. My teachers were from Thailand, Nigeria, Iran. This was the type of diversity that I grew up with. What I came to understand and define as education was being taught by and with people from all over the world. I also walked up and down the same stairwells several times a day, every day, for 13 years. Recently, I visited the school for the first time in a very long time, and I was shocked to discover how much renovation had taken place. But when I walked into the stairwell, I was relieved to see that it was exactly the same. When I got to the second floor landing, I put my hand out in front of me to push open the door. And as I did this motion, I saw my hand at age five, age 12, age 17, and now at age 24. It was a very bizarre feeling to actually see the passage of time. And I realized that this is one of the ways I mark and measure growth in my life by returning to a single place over and over again, having a constant to help me mark change. This school is the place that I first fell in love with stories. Starting in kindergarten, my teachers taught us through stories. They told us stories of Anansi the trickster from West African folklore, then Coyote the trickster from Native American stories, then Tom Sawyer tricking his friends. I recognized that the same characters were appearing in stories from different countries, wearing different names, but with the same themes and lessons. It's no surprise that Storytelling was an integral part of my childhood, and I'm sure it was a catalyst for my falling in love with spoken word poetry. I was 14 when I first saw spoken word poetry. It seemed like a combination of theater and poetry. Storytelling like I was used to from my childhood, but with precise language and delivery. I have since come to define spoken word poetry as a type of poetry that cannot stay on paper, that something about it demands it be and witnessed in person. I fell in love with it, and I was very fortunate to find a place called the Bowery Poetry Club in Manhattan, where adult poets shared spoken word poetry on a weekly basis. Despite the fact that I was 14 years old, these poets welcomed me and encouraged me, and for four years, this dark dive bar became my safe haven. I discovered that I was writing poems whenever there was something I was having trouble understanding. It was as though I was showing all of my work on a math problem. I would write a poem and share it as if to say, here, this is what I've got so far. I haven't solved it yet, but I'm working on it. The first time someone told me that they connected with one of my poems, it was like hearing them say, hey, I'm working on that too. Thanks for showing your work so that I can build on it. I've now been writing and performing spoken word poetry for 10 years, and the way that I've changed between age 14 and age 24 well, it hopefully is a lot, but the way I use poetry as a form of navigating has not changed. I still write a poem whenever there is something I am trying to figure out. Poetry has also become a way for me to measure growth. When I first write a poem, it is brand new and it feels awesome. I think it's perfect and it feels comfortable. It's like getting a brand new t-shirt, but then time goes by and I discover it in the bottom of a drawer somewhere and realize that I haven't seen it in a while. Maybe I've been feeling as though I've outgrown it, but when I do take it out, it shows me what parts of this poem still fit me, still feel comfortable, what parts fit me differently, what parts I've finally grown into. When I was younger, I used to think that there would be a moment where everything would finally fit, when I would be a grown-up and I would have figured it out and I would be able to handle everything that life threw at me. I understand now that people are never finished products. We are always a work in progress, and this is important. It is dangerous for me to think that I'm ever done growing or, or even that I don't need to grow as much. When I was in school, there was a structure in place was changing and growing. A year went by, I moved up a grade, I learned new subjects, did new things. It was easy to see that progress was being made. But now that I'm no longer in school, that structure is gone and I need to find ways to measure it for myself. I have grown and changed, largely because I've been blessed with the right mentors at the right time. Most of them I sought out myself, some I found by happy accident. Some of my earliest mentors were these poets at the Bowery Poetry Club. And because they treated me as an equal, as 
an artist and as a human, I was able to be a 14-year-old girl who had confidence in my own voice. And that is a gift that many people do not receive. And that is the cornerstone of my organization, Project Voice. My partner in poetry, Phil Kay and I, travel and perform spoken word poetry in schools and venues around the world. As a result, we have gotten to see classrooms and communities from New York to California to India to South Africa. Some people are surprised by how much we travel. They hear the words spoken word poetry and they have their own connotations, which cause them to envision a temporary new US-centric trend. They want to know if this art form is even relevant to people in Nepal or Australia, but this is an ancient art form, and it can already be found all over the place. Besides, this is the only way I understand education. For 13 years, I learned from people from every corner of the globe and saw how much we had to teach each other, how many stories we had to trade, and Project Voice is just an extension of that. It is a desire to encourage people to carefully craft their poems and perspectives so that they can share them and say, hey, this is what I've got so far. I haven't solved it yet, but I'm working on it so that the rest of us can learn and build. I used to be so relieved that I had mentors to look up to who I was sure had figured it out already. I know now that of there are works in progress the same way that I am. The fact that I still have poems to write tells me that I still have things to figure out. And yet now, there are people who consider me a mentor, and that is an enormous honor and a responsibility. It used to terrify me. I thought, I can't mentor anyone. I'm not old enough. I don't know what I'm doing yet. And I still feel that way, but keeping track of my own progress allows me to share that progress with others. Being a mentor means sharing what you've got so far and giving someone else the chance, the invitation to build on it. And I'm working on that all the time. I've discovered that being a mentor is an amazing way to show gratitude, to say thank you for the mentors that I have been given. One of the most important mentors in my life is a woman by the name of Kristen O'Keefe Aptowix. She is the first poet to ever teach me that it was okay to be a woman poet and still be silly sometimes. She also taught me about community and what it means to be a generous artist who shares resources Resources. She is inventive and intuitive and wise, and she created this exercise that I've been puzzling over. She asks her close friends to think of five adjectives that they want other people to describe them as in the order in which they are most important. A good way of thinking of it is to imagine a room full of people whom you admire and respect, and someone says, hey, do you know Kristen O'Keefe Aptowix? And another person says, yeah, I know Kristen. She's..." What do you hope they say? And then the second person says, you know what, you're right, she is, but did you know that she's also really... You get five words. It's not so much about guessing what other people actually say about us. It's about aspiration. It's about recognizing what are the personality characteristics that we prioritize. What type of people do we want to be? It is one more way of being mindful of our person and the progress we are making, especially if we revisit the list over the years. I can't wait to see what words change and what words stay there continues to be important to me and what will eventually no longer matter. Sharing those five words with someone is incredibly vulnerable, especially if you're being soul-bearingly honest. And I am too shy to share all five of mine, but I will share one of them. Generous. Generosity is saying thank you for what I have. Generosity is what I am working on and what I know I need to work on more, but it is important to me. Generosity is what I see in the best teachers whose classrooms I visit around the world. It is what I see in mentors who are not teachers, those who've taught me how to run a business, how to be an artist, how to be a constructive member of society. The first person to ever show me what it means to be a mentor was the principal of my elementary school. At the time, I did not realize that that's what she was showing me, but she embodied generosity because she was the purest advocate for children. She passed away recently, and I didn't realize what an important mentor she was to me until she was already gone. She was an Indian woman who wore saris to school every day. A sari is a traditional Indian dress. It's brightly colored and has lots of draping fabrics. I'd like to leave you with one final poem. It is dedicated to her and for everyone else who's willing to be a mentor, even while they are still a work in progress. 
I was visiting a school recently in northern India when I heard it for the first time in ages. It was barely audible over the shouting of children, the squeals and laughter bubbling up from the schoolyard through the classroom window, but it was there. The swish of silk saris and the jingle jangle of bangles on thin wrists like wind chimes. This is what learning sounds like, I remember. I remember when I was five years old, the principal of our junior school was Mrs. Ribeiro. She was an Indian woman the size of a nightlight, and she glided like a sailboat through the hallways of our school. Once, when I got close enough to grab a fistful of her dress, I lifted it to try and see if she had any feet at all. I thought she floated. We begged to be sent to her office, the hanging plants like a jungle above our heads, her quiet laughter. Adults needed an appointment, but we did not. And even when she was in a grown-up meeting, all it took was a gentle knock on the door, a peek around the corner, and she was off calling, sorry, dear, we'll have to reschedule. I have to meet with someone else about a very important matter. It's about a gold star. It's about a new diorama. It's about a finished reading book <gasps> one level higher than last time. She knew every student by name, visited every classroom, spoke to us like we were scholars, artists, scientists, athletes, musicians, and we were. My world was the size of a crayon box, and it took every color to draw her. Once, on a New York City sidewalk, a group of women in brightly colored saris walked by, and someone shouted, look, Ma, look at all those principles. My world was the size of a classroom. It was as tall as I could stretch my fingers, calling, please, pick me to be the one to read to Mrs. Ribeiro. Pick me to be the one to show her what I know. C L O D. Clothes, shirts, pants, socks, shoes, animals, cat, dog, bird, fish. Look how much I know. She brought us guests, artists, a petting zoo. They unpacked the cages in the parking lot while we were still tucked up in our classrooms unawares. The bunnies and the guinea pigs poked out their noses, but Mrs. Ribeiro came to pause in front of the llama cage. She and the llama considered each other for a long time before she asked whether he was tame enough to be brought inside. The trainers laughed and told her, yeah, he's plenty tame, but he doesn't know how to walk upstairs. So she led him to the elevator. And when the door slid open on the second floor, there was Barrow in a bright pink sari with gold bangles and a llama on a leash. She floated from classroom to classroom, and we stared, cheered, laughed, and shouted. We tugged at her sari, calling, Miss, what is that? Where did it come from? She made us question. She made us wonder. She made us proud of what we had learned. Clothes, shirts, pants, socks, shoes, saris, animals, cat, dog, bird, fish, llama. Look how much I've learned. She taught us to share. She taught us to listen to each other when someone else is speaking. And then she let us go. We were dandelion seeds released to the wind. She asked for no return. We are saplings now with gentle hands. The girl with bright pink cheeks and messy hairpins now works at an orphanage in Cameroon. The boy with the color-ordered markers, now a graphic designer in Chicago. The one with the best diorama, now an animal activist in Argentina. The one who loved to read out loud, now a poet in Sweden. She let us fly. And so I find myself at the front of a classroom. My students tug at my sleeves and ask me, Miss, do all poets have curly hair and wear crazy boots? I pray for patience. <laughs> I pray for wisdom to find a way to tame all the peculiar animals of this world, to coax them enough to brave the elevator, to watch the doors slide open to my students' gaping mouths, all their wild wonder. They worry about everything. They worry about what to write. They worry about their grades. They worry about who likes whom. They talk over each other until I cannot hear them. I tell them, listen, listen to each other like you know you are scholars, artists, scientists, athletes, musicians, like you know you will be the ones who shape this world. Show me how many colors you know how to draw with, how proud you are of what you have learned, and I promise I will do the same. Thank you.